I was just checking to see how much time I had. You know, I'm programmed to 60 and 30 seconds, so you don't have to worry about me going over here. Well, good morning. I guess it's still morning, isn't it? I just sat through a class in, uh, in college here, and what a great session. Two great speakers and great presentations, and you've had an excellent opportunity to download a lot of information over the past few minutes. Coming out here today, I was looking across the road, both sides, and I thought, what a mess. And I'm not talking about politics just yet. We'll get to that momentarily. I had a buddy I grew up with in southern Indiana, Dickie Smith, who just retired from being the school maintenance man. He was the janitor. He had a big ring full of keys as he would go down the hallway. You'd always hear him as he was coming down the hallway. He lived at the edge of town. He would come out and help us on the farm. He was a good buddy of mine, still is. And every now and then he would say, Armstrong, this is a mel of a hess. And it really brought home to me, of course, looking at any kind of a situation through life, what we were dealing with. And I think as we look at our nation and what's going on now, some of us who've watched this country over a long time are thinking, we got some serious problems here. I'll talk a little bit about that risk in a moment. As you look at the crops, and uh, you know there is that tendency, as the guys have talked here, about judging crops out your kitchen window. We always caution that during the drought years. And uh, these guys enumerated those years so vividly, except for one. And, and you didn't start with 74, Steve. Ooh, right. That was a famous year. And many of us are recalling that year because of the early frost that year. Southern it, Corn Leaf Blight, too. Southern Corn Leaf Blight. You hit that one on the head, too. I remember. That was stressful. I would go, the Watergate hearings were going on back in those days. Actually, Nixon resigned in 74. That was another thing to, to remember back in those years, all that was taking place there. But I remember it because I interviewed Earl Butts right after that big frost. I was a college student at Purdue, and Earl had been the dean of agriculture, and he was coming through. He was the secretary of agriculture under Nixon and Ford. Very colorful, some of you remember him. Very outspoken, some of you remember that. It ultimately cost him his job. But I remember Earl, well, Earl was the only guy who ever accused me of dyeing my hair. <laughs> True story. A, about five years before he passed away, he called me over to the seat where he was at the Farm Progress Show, and he said, why is your hair so dark? I said, what do you mean, Dr. Butts? He says, I know you, it shouldn't be that dark. <laughs> I never did it again after that, after Earl Butts called me on it. But he was the guy that took us into the business of exporting, of course, in a big, big way all around the world. And I couldn't help but think about that a little bit. You know, we haven't, nobody's really said these words yet today. Trade war. Nobody has spoken that yet. And we have to continue to be concerned about it and what the long-term ramifications are. And many of us feel and hope and pray at the end of the day, we're going to come out okay, but as we look at demand destruction and what's happening long term and we mentioned Brazil a few minutes ago you were talking about Brazil long term permanent changes have been made in the past few months and I think of Eldon not only for two reasons sitting, sitting here watching Eldon Gould listening to all of our discussion about risk management because of his leadership as director of the risk management agency in Washington where he rewrote policies as I recall with a the private companies back in those days. But I also think of Eldon because I was with him on trade missions for the old U.S. Feed Grains Council. As they worked to start in 1960, they started working to develop markets around the world, not only to expand those markets, but to retain the existing ones. We were in various sessions. I think I was on eight different trade missions with the Feed Grains Council, then the Grains Council, and watching those one-on-one -on -one relationships develop between our folks out of the field trying to develop markets and those overseas buyers. And it took a lot of work and still takes a lot of work. And to see things happen on the trade front where you worry about long-term trends, it's tough to watch because we know how hard it was to establish those markets. The other thing that's going on, and Steve talked about Brazil, long-term changes are continuing to be made down there. We've had the logistics advantages over the years because of our river system, which we failed to really upgrade on a timely basis. They have been ratcheting up not just their production, which continues to grow, but their infrastructure, which continues to be improved. And maybe just as important as anything else, 
They made a change at the top. They've got a guy running the country now that the farmers feel very good about. Many of them love him. He's making very substantial changes to their benefit and potentially to our detriment. Uh, I, there's one farmer, and I, and I watch him on Twitter. And I'll talk about Twitter briefly in a moment, but I watch his posts. There's a guy in Brazil, and I don't think he has too many followers, but every now and then he'll post something about wild Brazil. And this week he posted a python as it had swallowed a calf. And he showed a news reporter lying down next to it doing a report as this big python was trying to ingest this calf. I guess he figured he didn't have much to lose, but python had a mouthful and a body full already. But what he points out as well in some of his tweets is the tremendous advances that they continue to make in terms of production. And they're gonna be there forever. And they're gonna be there with continuing production gains. Not just soybeans, we've seen the safrinha corn crop uh, grow dramatically. I think some of the latest projections are the Brazilians might plant one to 2% more acres of beans this fall. They might, I, if I read it correctly, some are thinking they might ratchet up the safrinha corn crop by as much as 7%. They're there to stay as a major competitor of us, continuing to fight with us for the worldwide demand. At the end of the day, we hope, we hope that things will settle out to the benefit of all farmers, but it reminds me of one other risk you need to try to manage. And this may be the toughest one of all. Of all of the risks that you have in your business of farming, that political risk ultimately could cost you as much as a poor marketing decision. Now, as Steve was talking, yeah, control what you can control. But I would suggest too that you need to be concerned about trying to influence that political process. And that means on both sides of the aisle. I saw Bob Pritchard here a few minutes ago and was talking with him, and I, I, was, I was not just disappointed, somewhat devastated when he decided he wasn't going to run for re-election. You know why? Because it meant there was one fewer guy, one fewer person in the state legislature who understood, appreciated, and was working for agriculture. And in this state, oh my goodness, the cost of losing a farm state lawmaker. Now, there are others who have stepped up and are working hard in that whole process. But we're going to need both Republicans and both Democrats engaged in this whole process going forward. That's a risk. That's a big risk to you. If you're not trying in some way, shape, or form through an organization or on a one-to-one -one basis, getting to know your lawmaker, or in the case of Washington, getting to know his or her aides, the agriculture aide. Because that congressman or woman has a lot on their plate. There's a lot going on. They're involved in all kinds of processes, not the least of which is campaigning for the next election the moment that they are elected. But there's somebody on the staff, in many instances, designated as the ag expert. Make sure you get to know them. Work with Farm Bureau or Corn Growers, Soybean Association, whatever the group is you embrace, to try to have some kind of relationship with them so that you can have a channel, a, con uh, a conduct of some sort, conduit into them to, to bring them information about what's important to you. And being involved in the political process is crucial. If you're in a multi-generational farm and there's a generation behind you, you really have to be worried about the politics of the future. And it's ugly to get involved in. And in many instances, I'm sure Bob could relate a lot of horror stories of being involved in the political process. And it's distasteful to many of us. But if we don't identify young people who perhaps we can engage, encourage, finance in some way, good people that we know have the opportunity to succeed in that political process, then it's everybody else against us. And you know, as well as, as I do, sitting where you are located, uh, it's coming at you. And, uh, and the misconceptions, of course, you know, you deal in this every day. You know it so well. I don't have to talk to you about this. But it was fresh in my mind because I saw a tweet by this guy who is now, he, he was a former food editor, I think, for the New York Times. And he's now going to do a documentary on Iowa. And you've read what he has written. By, by the way, it's uh, PBS that's 
going to put it on, and I guess one of their underwriters is financing it. I'm not sure when it's going to air, but I read one of his columns, and it's every misconception about commercial agriculture that you can possibly imagine. And he's putting it out there as if it's the gospel. I mean, that, that locomotive is coming down the tracks, these challenges that are not going to go away in terms of the whole political process. Like Donald Trump or not, he has at least selected somebody I think is a pretty good Secretary of Agriculture. Not everybody can handle that job. Uh, Sonny Perdue, I think, was probably made for that job. There, there have to be days that he gets up in the morning, and especially after he reads tweets, he thinks, oh boy, how are we going to get through this one? He's got the temperament for it, though. Uh, by all means, he was the governor of Georgia. I actually drove Sonny's old tractor. Did you know that? Sonny got his dad's Farmall 656 a few years ago. And some guys restored it. At the time, Sonny Perdue was the governor of Georgia. And you know, I was going to be down there doing something. And they said, hey, do you want to drive the governor's old Farmall? It's all fixed up. And I thought, well, this is fun. This is going to be cool. They said, do we just need to take it a little ways from a shed on down into the field. They're going to do a photo shoot there, and uh, the governor will be brought out by a trooper, and they'll be waiting on you. What they didn't tell me was that it was to be transported in a suburb of Atlanta, that I would drive it through the suburb in the morning rush hour. <laughs> now, that is close to home for some of you, too, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, I got all those one-figured uh, salutes. Uh, who would expect Southerners to be so uncivil? Must have been the Yankees that moved down there, right? I hear that all the time. My wife and I moved down to North Carolina about five years ago. I fly back every week. I uh, hopped on a plane this morning at uh, 545 in Raleigh, and we come up and work with Mr. Ryan Rue standing over behind the camera here, one of our team members for this week in agribusiness, and a uh, Kane County resident, and really uh, appreciate his work. But uh, just to talk a little bit about the geography, they're hurting in that part of the world for moisture too. And uh, they need to have some, some rain down there. I think that's one thing that strikes us about this particular season, how widespread the challenge has been. And as Steve pointed out, you go west of the Mississippi River and it's a different story. Crop bulletins bear that out. For all of the flooding attention that we've seen on Nebraska, there's still a lot of good crop land out there and a lot of good crop growing. By the way, let me relate one story to you about that March flood. I was out there, we shot some stuff for RFD TV back in the spring. I was in the little town of Hamburg, Iowa, right there in the, in the flood plain of the Missouri River. Any of you know where Hamburg is? I was standing there with the farmer and he pointed down through the field there and he said, you see that tanker sitting down there? And it was a semi-tanker. I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, he said, that's uh, loaded with diesel fuel. I said, okay. He said, it was sitting right where we we're standing. That tanker was a quarter of a mile away from where we stood. The power of that water carried that loaded tanker without a tractor hooked to it, carried that tanker that far. The tank was intact, not compromised in any way, and the fuel was still good in there. So, that was a reminder of the, the power of water, but again, somewhat of a small area despite the impact of that flood. There's a lot of good crop out there, as Steve pointed out. Different stories you go east, as you know. I think if you looked at the worst states of the weekly crop bulletin last night, the five worst states were, uh, not in this order necessarily, but Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Missouri, and North Carolina on corn. And the five worst in the condition ratings, again, just the condition ratings, uh, for soybeans would have been Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Missouri, and Michigan, interestingly enough, in terms of the actual condition ratings, if you buy into watching that. And, but I just want to reinforce one thing Steve said, too, in terms of USDA's reputation that has really taken a hit in recent days. As we said years ago, if they weren't in the business of doing it, only Cargill and ADM and the private estimators would be. Uh, doing it. I think I have a little more faith in USDA. But government will continue to play an important role in what you do. One thing to anticipate, as we've been talking about these payments out of the trade war, is to anticipate what rabbit could be pulled out of the hat in an election year. And if you think back, 
through presidential election years. And this is a bipartisan thing. I mean, everybody's been involved in this, Democrats and Republicans. There are things that get pulled out of the hat to try to, in some way, uh, encourage that vote for that incumbent. So what will it be? Will there be some of those things? It'll keep your eyes open for things that could be coming up, even on a local basis, that might be an effort to uh, influence the election. Well, you know, I have a tendency, and, and this has been so great listening this morning to Dave and Steve, because I reflect back on many of these years. We like, like to talk about analogous years. And as these guys have pointed out, there's really no good comparison for this one. But as I was driving out today, listening to the forecast, the heat is going to be so bad, it could kill you this weekend. <laughs> Do you remember back when that, when, you remember, don't you, when it was so bad in Chicago, they were storing the carcasses and reefers that summer? Yes. And there was a little controversy after all was said and done. I was on the the fire commission over in the Lyle Woodridge and Naperville area on the board of fire commissioners at the time, and I remember the debate about how many people actually died from the heat. But of course, Chicago has a record for difficulty in counting things. <laughs> Whether it's people showing up in Grant Park, or uh, voters, or, or at the same time, uh, carcasses from the heat of summer. But it was hard not to think back uh, to those days. One thing that occurs to me, too, thinking about this, is how it's a stressful time for so many of you. And I remember that, of course, in, in other years when we've had short crops or low prices or something else going on, maybe even a, that political risk I was talking about. And managing that stress, and, and, and Steve referenced this with the farmer that he was talking about, Marty, you know, handling some of this marketing, getting that done, and then finding a way to relieve stress a little bit. And a lot of us need to find a way to do that because it's not easy. And, and if you don't find a way to do it, it wears you down. I put my fat ass on it. I can say that, can I? <laughs> I put mine on a bicycle. I don't go on the roads. I don't trust the motorists that are always trying to pass you when you're doing a left turn. I get on a trail somewhere. There's one over in the Wheaton, Naperville area that I ride. And there's another one down in North Carolina. The difference, this one has crushed rock. That one is paved down in North Carolina. The other difference is the size of the snakes. <laughs> These are like shoestrings. Those down there along the Noose River, when you go over one, it's like a fire hose. And sometimes you just have to go over one. They come out so fast, you raise your legs, <laughs> which isn't easy for a fat boy like me, but you raise your legs as high as you can. I find that time out there away from the smartphone, which I left today in my vehicle, which Mrs. Armstrong instructed me to do when we had dinner the other night. I left that stress away, and then I get out there and clear my head. If it's only for 45 minutes or an hour, just diverting your attention, listening to a few tunes, just getting away from it for a little bit can really make a difference. It does for me, and I think maybe it might help for you too. But whatever it is, maybe you pump iron, maybe you run. I can't run, but maybe that works for you. Find a way to try to relieve that stress a little bit. The other word of caution, and this goes back to the days of my youth, when Jim and Stella Faye Armstrong said, stay out of the pool hall. We don't want you in the pool hall. And after football practice, a lot of guys would go up there and get a cheeseburger. And I wanted to go in there so badly, but folks explained to me, mom and dad explained, there were guys playing cards in there. There were guys playing pool in there. Pinball, what's wrong with pinball, for goodness sake? They were not the kind of people my parents wanted me to be around and to be influenced by. And you know what? It was pretty good advice. Not that there was something sinful, not that there was something unlawful, not that there was something amoral, but these weren't the kind of characters that I should be learning from being influenced by and motivated by. They knew that there were better people in the community that I could be around. Have you thought about that a little bit? You know one thing, and I, I just loved it, listening to the discussion about Twitter, because it's just like the coffee shop of 30 years ago. And you remember going into the coffee shop, some of you, 30 years ago, sitting around there in the depths of that agriculture, agriculture depression of the 80s, 
And if you weren't feeling lousy when you went in there, <laughs> with all of those, can you top this stories, you were feeling lousy. It was like reading the front page of the Des Moines Register back in those days. The late great Don Mum was the farm writer. And nothing he wrote made it on the front page. Every negative, bad story you could possibly imagine was right on the front page of the Des Moines Register. I remember it. And it's the kind of thing that feeds on itself after a while. Twitter is a wonderful tool. I haven't forsaken it yet. I still follow. I, I, I actually have a shadow Twitter account under a fake name because I set that up with key individuals I want to watch. Economists I really, really, re ex you know, have come to respect. Market analysts I've come to it and respect over the years. Folks in the world of politics that I follow, certain media outlets on that list is getting a little bit slimmer, I must say, at all times. But I'm watching people that I ought to be watching. You know, it's, it's like anything, Twitter becomes, uh, you know, you've got the class clowns in there, you've got the Dave, Donnie Downers in there, and there are some really good people, and some motivational, some motivational people who are tweeting that you really ought to follow too. They may be injecting things that are just quotes of the day. It may be faith-based. There's some pretty good stuff on Twitter, so don't totally forsake it. Just be a little bit uh, selective. And the last thing, how can you possibly run as complex a business as has been laid out here by these excellent presentations before me, unless you surround yourself with the best team you can possibly avail yourself of. The complexity of agriculture today is so great, you can't be, I maintain you can't be the expert that you need to be in all of those disciplines. But can you access the best agronomic advice? Sure you can. Can you find the best marketing advice? Absolutely. Crop input procurement? Yeah. Legal? Absolutely. That's, in this day and age, you, you need to have that help. My son-in-law is a lawyer, and I still like him. <laughs> and my wife loves him, which is a whole other story. But you need to put the best team around you that you possibly can. To, to succeed today. I really believe that, and I think that's maybe the most important point to leave with you. Some of you invite us in to your homes uh, via radio or television. We sure appreciate that, too. It's been a blessing for us. I hang out with that guy by the name of Orion Samuels and have for 42 years. That's right. I was 13, I think. Actually, funny, funny true story about this week. Yesterday was the 50th anniversary of me getting my FCC license. Back in those days, to run a radio station, you had to have a license issued by the Federal Communications Commission. I mean, to even just go in and, and be an announcer. And you had to take a test. And you had to take a test in a big city. So I went, we were going up to visit relatives. Oh, yeah, there was another reason. I was going up to Detroit to be in the National Bible Bowl. And so I went up there, and that summer I got everything done. The, FCC license, I took the test, I got my driver's license that same week, it was in the National Bible Bowl, and never missed a Sunday of Sunday school until I got into the radio business, and that was the beginning of the end, I guess you'd have to say. But thank you for all of the support that you've given us over the years. Those of you who happen to be in our audience from time to time, we sincerely appreciate it. Thank you for the opportunity to come out and join you today. Joe, thank you. It's good to see all of you folks here, and to benefit from your expertise, you guys, Steve and Dave. Have a good day. Thank you.